next, somebody I'm sure needs no introduction who became the 40th Prime Minister of New Zealand. <laughs> who, age 37, became one of the world's youngest female heads of government and is now embracing a new chapter of life, having stepped down from her role in February. Please welcome the Right Honourable Dame Jacinda Ardern. <laughs> Wonderful to see you. Wonderful to be here. Um, likewise, with uh, Fatma, the last time we were here in this room, was uh, the draw for the tournament with all that hope and, and expectation. How much pride do you take? Because you were so integral in bringing the tournament here. Oh, it, you know, I feel incredibly proud to uh, have seen New Zealand and New Zealanders just embrace this competition. Mm. You know, I think when the, the government set out to host this event, you know, you make a bid and then you hand it over to the country and just let the country do what it does so well, and that is host people and look after people. And what a magnificent job New Zealand has done. So it's been incredible. <laughs> is, is there a moment that stood out for you? Or have you got, have you got a, a picture in your mind that you will kind of take with you from the tournament so far? Oh, my word, that opening match. <laughs> that opening match. Um, I felt, I felt slightly ridiculous because <laughs> at the end of that game, I started to cry and I did not stop crying for quite some time. And when we went down to the dressing room, what a treat to be able to see the team. Mm. And, you know, I just said to them, you, you cannot know in this moment in time the impact that you've had for the game and for, you know, women and girls in sport in New Zealand. It's just incredible. They are part of a revolution, and what a revolution it is. Yeah, because it's not just the football World Cup. You've had the Rugby Women's World Cup as oh. well. As, how do you see the role... And the cricket. And the cricket, of course. <laughs> um, how do you see the role of sport in the fight for equity and equality? You know, I was, I was reminding myself again today, I mean, one of the reasons that Grant Robertson, the Minister of Sport, when he came in, he said... Straight off the bat, my, my focus will be women and girls in sport. And so in 2018, uh, he put out a strategy, and it was to lift the participation and the visibility uh, of women and girls in sport in New Zealand and, you know, what he's managed to do. Uh, but for all the right reasons, mm -hmm. you know, girls are 50% more likely to drop out of sports by the time they're 14. Mm -hmm. So for a sporting mad nation, we were doing something wrong for our girls uh, and there's lots of reasons why, and we've got to think about that right from grassroots. Uh, and we've all got a role to play in that, the way we talk about the game, right through to the way that we acknowledge uh, after, you know, high-level competition, our, our women and girls, but even right through to uniforms. But no, we were talking about um, you know, the fight for equality and parity within national associations and, and federations. You are somebody used to dealing with policy. What would be your message to those associations, those people who were reluctant to give their women's teams, the, the women's setup, parity with the men? Well, the first thing I'd say is actually one of the, right from the outset, it wasn't just about having a strategy, it was about saying to those governing boards, you need to have 50% women on your governing boards because, you know, we've got to amplify the voice of women and girls, and one place to do that is, is right at the top. Uh, and so I think that was a really important part of the strategy. But then thinking about it at every level, as I say, it's not enough to think about how do we elevate people in those top tiers. If you haven't done the grassroots job, then you haven't got that pathway for people. For me, though, I'm in policy making, it's always about bring the evidence and bring the lived experience. Mm -hmm. Talk to the people who know, who are, who are going through it, who understand it. If you're going to write a policy on mental health, bring in people who have experienced the mental health system. If you're writing about strategies in sports, bring in your practitioners, your sports people. That, for, that for me, is key. And what's your strategy for dealing with the people who aren't going to believe the strategy, <laughs> aren't going to get on board with what you're saying? I suspect yeah. there's been a fair few people who you've had to deal with, and you've had to overcome sexism and people who just didn't think you should be in the room. Yeah. Yeah, and look, the experience that I had, though, 
far different than the experience of Helen Clark, far different than the experience of Jenny Shipley, than Marilyn Waring. Uh, I truly believe that for all of us, whether we're you know, in politics or sports, someone before us laid a pathway that we are then blessed to stand on. And it gets easier for every next person. I think the key, though, is that we're in, when we're in those roles, when we're blessed to be in those roles, Let's not pretend that we're perfect. We're not. We're humans. We make mistakes. We get things wrong. In this day and age, I think we've come to a point where we dehumanize our leaders sometimes, and we dehumanize our sports people, and we expect them to be superhuman and super resilient. Yeah. But they're just people. I think the more that we're willing to display that we're just people, the more likely perhaps people will be a little more forgiving the more likely that someone else might say, well, I'm a human, I can, maybe I can do it too. We'll get greater diversity of leadership, I think, if we allow ourselves to just be our authentic selves. Did, did office feel like a fight to you? Did you feel like you were fighting? Not all the time. I think it gets portrayed like that, unfortunately. I think, uh, you know, politics is portrayed like it's a blood sport. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I've probably, you know, obvious, uh, obvious point to make. I'm not the sporting type. And I, um, I didn't go into politics because I liked the cut and thrust. I went into it because I just thought it was a, a place you could make a, a difference. Mm. And so that isn't the day-to-day -day experience. One of the things I really um, regret about, and this isn't just in New Zealand, this is global, you don't actually see the times when you work together. And politicians work together a lot. Mm. And wouldn't it be nice if we spent a little more time talking about the times we cooperate? Because when New Zealand needs everyone to rally, we rally mm -hmm. at every level. But unfortunately, that doesn't make a very interesting headline or a very interesting <laughs> story. So you don't get to see it that much. I guess it would be the equivalent of every sporting match being a draw. <laughs> um, uh, but so it's not a fight every day. And it never felt like a fight every day for me. I got a lot of joy out of the job. I just didn't get to talk about the joyful bits as much. What, was, what gave you the most joy? The little, the little things. Mm. One of my favourite things to do was to go and visit high schools and talk to students, you know, because they were, they were just so grounded in what they wanted to see and what their expectations were. They weren't cynical. You're in power, <laughs> go and do something, fix it. Um, and I like that simplicity as well. Um, and then the little things, just, you know, seeing a problem and knowing that you had it with, within your power to do something about that, that problem. Uh, with that, though, comes some pretty, you know, extreme emotions on both sides. On the one hand, people can feel very emotionally that you fixed something for them. On the other, people can feel very deeply that you ruined something for them. So that's, that's just what, you, what comes with the job. And you have often described yourself as a feminist. Yeah. What does that mean to you? And, and has that changed over the course of, of your career. Does anyone in this room believe that women should be limited uh, in anything based on the fact that they are a woman? <laughs> you know, should they receive unequal pay? Should they have different access to leadership? Should they be, you know, should they expect to experience violence in their lives? I believe that actually break it down in a simple way and most people would say they were feminists. Yeah, I would hope. Yeah. <laughs> My final thing, for you, moving forwards, uh, using your platform, what is the most important thing for you in, in the fight for equity and inclusion? Again, I, I come back to these simple measures, mm -hmm. you know, what kind of world is my daughter going to step into? Now, the beautiful thing for me is that I never grew up thinking that my gender would get in the way of me being able to work in politics because of people like Jenny Shipley and Helen Clark. And now, you know, my daughter's going to look to the future and she'll think that she can be an elite athlete because of the football ferns or the black ferns, and she's seen it in real time. It's about just continuing to break down those barriers wherever we see them. And what an, as Ruby said, what an amazing time to be a part of. But everyone 
everyone makes a little contribution in that regard. Every time they do something a little bit differently than it was done before, every time they wear the consequence of that, if there is, every time they go out of their comfort zone and just push a little further along, you're laying that pathway for someone else. That, that's legacy. And what a legacy you have left already. Jacinda Ardern, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.